I have kind of some uh, housekeeping to do. The first thing I want to mention uh, is just a disclaimer about this presentation. Uh, it will make more sense as I go into the presentation. It gets a little bit meta. Um, but it's all built with HTML, and it's all built using fonts that are in development. Uh, the font that's shown here is a font that I've been working on. It's a revival of uh, Stevenson Blake Grotesque number no. 5. Also, the font that you saw at the beginning here uh, is called Chi from James Edmondson, who's in the audience. It's a variable font. As you can see, it's slowly squishing around. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. But because of all these moving parts, and also because we had a last minute technical issue here, and I had to switch to Frank's computer at the last minute, thank you, Frank, for that help. If something breaks, um, maybe give me a little bit of leniency here, because I'm juggling a lot of technical issues. Um, also, before I start, I'd like to do just kind of a quick survey to uh, get an understanding. I know all the type of Cooper students, uh, and that's mostly who this talk was uh, arranged for, but I'm curious about the other people in the audience, uh, your experience with design. I'd like to see a show of hands of anyone who has designed a website before. Okay, that is very encouraging. Now, I'd also like to see a show of hands of anyone who has designed a typeface before. Not as many people, but still a good amount. And finally, I'd be curious to see how many people have used a typeface before that wasn't completely finished, um, but they used it in a public project. Okay even fewer people. That's about how I expected it to go. Um, these questions will become a little more uh, apparent why I'm asking them as I move along here. But to get back to the topic at hand, I, this photo I made at the Hamilton Woodtype Museum, as Frank mentioned in uh, his introduction, uh, I've been involved with the Woodtype Museum, um, and it's kind of a uh, counterbalance to a lot of the web design and more high technology things that I do. Um, I am very much interested in what the most recent current technology is, but I'm also very interested in uh, historical type information, including machines. Uh, actually, this is a good moment to mention uh, the American Typecasting Fellowship Conference, which is going to be in San Francisco in August. I don't even know if they have a web page for this, but this is kind of an example of things that I'm interested in. It's a group of mostly old people who are into old type manufacturing equipment, type casting equipment. And so this is kind of uh, all of these interests of mine inform each other. Uh, and that is what brought me ultimately to this, uh, this topic and, and the ideas that I'll be sharing today. So, of course, everyone here knows about Gutenberg, uh, his famous 42-line Bible, which was not the first printed thing that ever existed, uh, not even the first from him. And even though many people, this is kind of the one thing most people associate with Gutenberg and with the beginning of printing, um, the first thing that we know of that was printed and distributed was actually just a single sheet piece of paper. It wasn't a large book. Um, and this is something that recurs throughout type history is, uh, especially as you go further and further back into type history, the things that most people know about are the things that were designed to last. And they were designed uh, like the Bible and like many printed books uh, at the beginning of uh, when printing and typography started to become an actual thing, uh, these things were meant to last a long time, and they did, and that's why we know about them, and that's great. However, there's this whole other side of printing and typography <coughs> that doesn't get quite as much attention. There are some niche groups uh, that are interested in this concept, but um, there's this idea of job printing, and actually I'd be curious, how many of you have heard this term job printing before? Even fewer than people who have used new fonts in public projects. That's about also what I expected, so uh, it proves my point a little bit. Uh, the idea of job printing is basically uh, odd jobs that had to be printed, uh, things that mostly were ephemeral, 
uh, small handbills, posters, uh, wedding announcements, things like that. Here's a great handbill that's advertising job printing. It's a piece of job printing that's advertising the service of job printing, which I like. Um, but the other thing that I like about this is this weird six down here. This isn't necessarily a, a font that was unfinished or uh, rarely used or anything like that, but it helps to kind of uh, ease into this idea, which I'll be returning to multiple times tonight, that uh, a lot of the weirder things that you see in printing history tend to happen with things that weren't designed to last or to be used for a long time. They were meant to be uh, ephemeral or uh, thrown away after you were used, used them. <clears throat> and a lot of this came about around the time of the uh, Industrial Revolution. There was job printing before the Industrial Revolution, but that really is what kicked it into high gear. Um, the birth of advertising and of commercial design and uh, commercial art really exploded in the 1800s, especially the early 1800s to the mid-1800s, and continued to grow uh, up until 1900 and beyond. Um, and as there was more demand for uh, commercial printing, there were more people that were looking for ways to outdo their competitors. If you're in a landscape like this that is just completely cluttered with a million things yelling at you, you have to do whatever you can to get some attention at your piece of printing. So not surprisingly, you start seeing uh, very heavy typefaces, very ornamental typefaces, typefaces with weird effects and shades, and this is not typically the kind of typography you would see used in a book or in some kind of design work that was meant to last for more than a month or a year or so. Um, if anything, you might see it in the title page of a book, um, but other than that, uh, most typography was much more subdued. And there's an interesting kind of relationship between typography um, and entertainment, uh, because especially for things like circuses, like these, these are showing circus bills, um, it's kind of, a circus is already a little bit absurd and showy and uh, ostentatious. And when you put it in the environment where there's so much competition for visual attention, uh, things start getting really out of hand. And as you can see here, uh, they did not hold back in using interesting, weird, and different typefaces. And I think this, of, of all the kind of things I could even have shown, this is a little bit more on the subdued side. But also there's <coughs> some competition uh, at, at the time in the 1800s with chromolithography. Chrom chromolithography, which I think was patented in 1837, uh, really put the fire under the butts of the people who were printing using uh, pre-made fonts because chromolithography allowed you to do things, work on curves and bend your letters and colorize things and shade things in ways that were very hard or impossible to do um, with a pre-made font that was cast in metal or cut from wood. And so as the 18th century moved on, you kind of see this interesting uh, relationship as things got more and more showy and uh, more and more examples existed for sign painters to make their signs and their advertising even more crazy and elaborate and colorful. Um, the type founders and the type manufacturers uh, had to keep up with that if they wanted to keep printing and uh, maintain that kind of attention. So this is an example actually of a a sign painter's alphabet. It looks like a typeface. It could theoretically be a typeface, but this is pretty typical of something uh, you'd see, especially in France, of uh, either sign painting or chromolithography that takes advantage of multiple colors in a way that was very hard to do with a uh, printed type. But then, of course, um, came the idea of bringing multiple colors into type. So this is an example, a pretty early example of um, chromatic wood type. Uh, 
as you'll probably notice, most of the stuff that I'm showing today gets just more and more bonkers as you go. And that's kind of what I like about it. It's, um, it's a little bit a theater of the absurd and this competition uh, between typography and lettering and uh, really fueled that absurdity. So this is actually uh, two pages from one of my favorite books or my favorite book. It's uh, Specimens of Chromatic Wood Type. It's a very large book and it's uh, showing it up on a screen even now projected whatever eight feet tall that still doesn't do it uh, the service. If you ever have a chance to have a look at this book, it's really kind of, I think, the pinnacle of this idea of introducing multiple colors and overprinting into typography. By the end of the 1800s, things had just gone completely crazy, uh, especially in the realm of metal type. Many of the foundries had pages that were just filled with stuff like this that was like, uh, I feel like some of these things you had to be on drugs to come up with. Uh, and I think it, by the time things kind of reached that crescendo of just insanity in uh, decoration, that's when modernism started to kind of push back against that. And, and throughout the 19th century, you see things start to tone down a lot more, at least until the second half of the 19th, or 20th century, sorry. Um, for the sake of time, I skipped over some uh, topics that are also related to the relationship between printing and the demands of the market and uh, the creation of new typefaces. For example, uh, in newspaper printing, many new typefaces were developed uh, specifically for those purposes. Um, but I wanted to kind of skip ahead to photo typesetting and uh, the second half of the 20th century because I feel like there were a lot of things happening that mirrored what happened um, in the 1800s. Most of what I think really fueled the whole style of the 1960s and 1970s and what people think of as funky design or psychedelic design, um, at least in terms of printing, maybe not necessarily lettering, is the fact that um, photo typesetting, which uh, had previously been not very practical to do, all of a sudden around the 60s became very easy to do. If you could develop a strip of film that had your alphabet on it, there were many machines that could uh, be used to typeset words with those letters. And this comes back to the idea of using typefaces that aren't necessarily complete. Uh, there were many typefaces that existed that weren't even a full character set. Uh, they probably didn't have a whole, maybe not even an uppercase or not a lowercase, um, but still it was very practical for people to make them and to use them. And there was a, uh, compared to something where if you're casting metal type, you have to, you have this whole industrial process. Uh, it's a lot easier to expose a strip of film to use for uh, your typesetting. And this resulted in all kinds of crazy things. This is a pretty typical example of stuff that came out of the 70s, um, which interestingly has a lot in common with things that came out in the 1800s. Um, and this was all uh, very easy to do. If Playgirl wanted to have a custom typeface that wasn't using a uh, photo setting, it would have cost them a lot more money and maybe it wouldn't have happened, they would have had to use a typeface that uh, existed off the shelf. And so again, again, in the 70s, you see these kinds of things happening. Uh, I've just put this in because I think it's really funny and cool. <laughs> this is Seymour Quast. Uh, and this was published in the Pushpin Graphic, which was a publication that his studio uh, released. Uh, it wasn't really used in the publication, but just the fact that they could publish and the, the means of production uh, throughout the 20th century just continued to get easier and easier and more accessible and more accessible uh, to the point where it's very easy just to publish a kind of one-off uh, magazine and not spend a, a fortune on it. 
Um, and a lot of these typefaces that were being created uh, for custom jobs, either for magazines or just for fun projects, there were also a lot of type design competitions. Uh, if they caught on and it seemed like people liked them, a lot of times they would make it into uh, the catalogs of larger type or lettering companies' uh, offerings. Uh, so these are a lot of examples. Of it. I included this one in particular because it was related, I think, to the, the typeface I used on my uh, intro slide. Um, but it's just this kind of stuff, I don't think if if it required a whole industrial uh, mechanism to, to do this beyond photographic uh, reproduction, a lot of these styles I don't think wouldn't, would have existed, especially because some of these styles themselves are just photographic manipulations of an existing style. So I think this obese condensed uh, Obese expanded is just obese condensed, but it's been photographically stretched and skewed to look kind of goopier and weirder. Um, and if you ever get a chance to go through a photo lettering catalog, I highly recommend it because it's just, this is only the tip of the craziness iceberg. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit again uh, to another era where the means of production and especially type production really uh, became even easier than they were with photo typesetting is desktop publishing. And uh, now probably were, there's at least some people in the room that remember the beginning of the desktop publishing revolution. But uh, in the 80s when uh, desktop computers became more accessible and people could start, you know, uh, laying out their own magazines and things like that. Uh, it was very empowering, but it also, I think, spurred a lot of creativity in people who were interested in typography, even if they weren't necessarily professional typographers. Uh, and of course, the establishment uh, typographers probably held their nose at some of this stuff, but a great example, I think, is Emigre. I believe uh, Rudy and Susanna are in the room. I did not know they'd be here, so I'm a little... <laughs> embarrassed to be talking about their work while they're sitting here. But Emigre, uh, I think, is a really great example of a situation where because the means of production are became easier, and maybe you can correct me after the talk if I'm interpreting it wrong, uh, it allowed them to do a lot of things that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do as easily if they were relying on a production house or someone else who is doing the layouts and uh, mechanicals and things like that. The really cool thing about Emigre was it was a real magazine with real articles, um, but it also, um, beyond just kind of stylistically pushing what was possible with editorial design, it also pushed new typefaces that uh, were just coming out or were in development. And it's, uh, it seems like they fed off each other. The, the magazine required new typefaces. And when you make new typefaces, of course, you want to use them in a new place. And I think it is a, a really great example of that. Uh, whether or not you like the style is a matter of taste. But uh, you can't ignore the fact that it was uh, a means of encouraging new typeface development, which I enjoy. Once the uh, web came around, then things started getting a little bit weirder because uh, in some ways, things were easier than they had ever been. You could publish an article on the web uh, with the push of a button, but the control you have over the layout and the design is uh, much more limited. It was also limited with desktop publishing and even with photo type setting, um, but the web is kind of an extreme, and especially it was uh, at the inception in the 90s. So for a very long time, on the web, most of the type that you would see was just system default fonts, things like Times and Arial and things like that. It wasn't possible to reliably use fonts in a website and expect that the person on the other side was going to see what you intended. 
unless you converted the type into an image or uh, something that was no longer what I would even really consider type. It was an image. Uh, until, and so, yes, this is kind of a classic example that I've seen shown uh, many times before about how Amazon used to look. And this is pretty representative of how most of the web looked. If you could only change the size of things, uh, and this maybe even have been before you could change colors of things, uh, things look very gray. This is no longer the cool layouts of emigre. It's no longer the funky stuff you see from photo type setting, and it definitely is not the really cool, weird, interesting stuff from the 1800s. Um, people started jumping on this idea of making images, though, and it started to create an interesting kind of disconnect. Anything that was real text, like down here, that could be translated or copy-pasted or searched, uh, still was stuck with these default system fonts. But then uh, maybe because people were stuck in that mode for normal text, when they had the opportunity to put text into an image, they kind of went all out and uh, put drop shadows and put things on curves and put like big starbursts and things like this. And I, it has the same kind of spirit, I think, fundamentally, as a lot of the stuff that was happening in the 1800s. Um, but at the same time, it was not a good thing for the web, necessarily. Technically, it was limiting. Um, and as I'll talk in a few more slides, uh, it definitely limited what, what you can do with the flexibility of text. Um, this is a page from geocities.com. Actually, how about a show of hands? Who had a GeoCities web page here? Wow, that's actually pretty good. So if you're not familiar with GeoCities, I think of GeoCities almost as like uh, an interesting peak in the uh, overall creativity on the web. It definitely was not a pinnacle of design taste on the web, um, but what it was is uh, it allowed anyone, myself included, to make a web page if they could figure out some of the code and grab some images and uh, put together their content uh, without any, without being forced into some existing template system. They are limited in the code they could use and what was possible with HTML and uh, this probably was even before CSS, but um, people were making their own things. And they were starting from scratch. And they were uh, copy pasting from other people's code. And it was, a, I think, a very creative time in the web. So I look back on those times with fondness. The interesting thing now is that there are very few uh, platforms like this that exist where any user can kind of freeform design what they want uh, without getting into you know, having a paid subscription or uh, knowing a little bit more advanced technology. Uh, this is myspace.com, probably circa 1998, if I had to guess. Uh, I don't actually know if this is legitimately a MySpace. It looks like a MySpace page. Uh, but MySpace was another interesting kind of platform because much like Facebook now, it was a social network, and it's where a lot of people met many of their friends and kept in touch with their friends. Um, but it was not limiting, uh, definitely not as limiting as things like Facebook are now. Um, probably there's a good argument that letting people do whatever they want with their Facebook page didn't lead to the best user experience for the people who were trying to read those pages. Uh, but again, it was an example of people, uh, once they had a platform and they could kind of manipulate things, they started to get very creative, um, even if it wasn't uh, well-informed or tasteful by standard uh, definitions. So as all this creativity is starting to well up in the web, uh, the standards for what you can do on the web are also adapting and it starts to look like things are going to be really cool. Um, 
this idea of responsive design starts to come around and people think about websites not as fixed static things, but as things that can adapt to different contexts, to different sizes of screens, um, to different user settings. Also, not too long after that, around 2008, you started to finally be able to use web fonts on a page uh, reliably that weren't installed on uh, the person who's viewing your website's computer. So this is a very good recipe, I think, for, for a lot of creativity to happen. And indeed, there were uh, many examples in the, I don't know, around 2005 to 2010 uh, that I remember at the time thinking, okay, now this is, not only are we going to be able to do things that have as much finesse as print, but they are more complex. You can do more interactive things, more dynamic stylization. Uh, this is an example of a page. Uh, I believe this one was designed by Jason Santa Maria, and it's from a series of pages that were called the Lost World Fair. And when this first came out, looking at this, most people thought, okay, that's just a Photoshop image that they put on a web page, but it's actually live text. Uh, and let's see, I'm risking something here by trying this, but uh, it stretches around and it does more than just sit statically on the page. Let's go back to full screen mode here. Or not. This is where my presentation starts to break down. All right, sorry, I'm going to have to scroll back to where I was. Right around the same time was a moment where the people who were previously making their web presence on platforms like GeoCities uh, started to move uh, first to Facebook, where all their friends were, and then to other larger and more centralized places. Um, I don't want to sound like I don't like that concept. Many of these platforms made it very easy for people to keep in touch in ways they couldn't before, to publish content in ways they couldn't before, but there were uh, some side effects to that that um, I don't necessarily think of as being good. So this is Facebook. I'm guessing there's at least a couple people here that work at Facebook or have worked at Facebook. Uh, it seems like when you're in the Bay Area, that's always the case. There are many things that I really like about Facebook. Uh, keeping in touch with many of my relatives would be almost impossible if it wasn't for Facebook. Um, however, it's very much a templated system. That's by definition what it is. There are uh, small areas where uh, users can in, insert their own creativity or upload images, but then it starts almost reverting back to the situation um, before web fonts and things like that where people are just relying on images to get across their uh, any text that doesn't fall within the template system of Facebook. So this is actually a page from a group called the Sign Painting Support Group, which I, I mean, to be completely honest with you, I don't use Facebook that much. A lot of times when I do, I read through the Sign Painting Support Group, and there's a lot of interesting information there. Sometimes it gets a little heated. Uh, there's some drama. But there's a lot of good content there, and it's all stuck in this container of Facebook. The pro of that is that probably more people are seeing it than they might than might otherwise. Um, but on the other side, if you don't use Facebook, uh, you can't see it. Uh, I don't believe, well, I don't know what the settings are now. But there are many situations where uh, the information has been kind of locked within these systems that you have to participate in to be able to access. You could argue that just using the web is uh, kind of like that, but especially more recently, the, the ability to get online has been easier and easier, at least in the US. Um, 
medium is another great example of something that I think uh, the reading experience on medium uh, can be very great. There definitely is no shortage of interesting content on Medium, but unless you're uploading images, uh, you're still restricted to what they will allow you to do. Unlike GeoCities, where you could almost do whatever, uh, and I'm not necessarily even saying that I think Medium would be better if it was more like GeoCities, but it, I just want to point out that it's this uh, pre-existing structure that uh, you're confined to if you're using that as your publication. Sometimes that's worth a trade-off. If you don't want to set up a page, it's a lot easier to just sign up for a Medium account and start typing and publish something very quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to like talk trash about these things. I'm just trying to point out that at this one moment where all of this creativity started swelling up, it seemed like it was then funneling into these uh, templated systems. Squarespace is another example. Maybe there are some Squarespace employees here. I don't know. Um, Squarespace, again, I think uh, a lot of the things they do are great for empowering people to make websites who would have no way of doing that otherwise or um, would not be able to do it with as much kind of style. But again, even if you're modifying your own uh, code with Squarespace, you're still stuck within kind of the constraints of their system. And uh, especially if you're working from an existing template, uh, which seems to happen very often, then you're inheriting code that maybe you don't even understand what it does, but uh, it influences the overall design of the web page. Some examples of things that uh, that I think about when I uh, think of uh, this creativity right around the time when responsive design and web fonts were starting to come out that didn't get funneled into uh, a template system, there are much fewer examples I can think of. And most of them exist as extensions of a web publication. And sometimes they may even be an extension of a template system from that web publication. Um, but a lot of times they get uh, more flexibility and kind of more uh, room for having customized design. ProPublica is a great example of an organization where a lot of their content is within their template system. I think their template system is well designed, but occasionally they will also publish feature articles that are completely free of that. The typography is free to do whatever it wants and at the risk of, again, having to break something here. I'm going to try to go to this other screen to show kind of how some of this stuff works. So this isn't a particularly like avant-garde layout. Uh, but what is interesting about it, I think especially, is the, the title treatment. When it's just a static thing, uh, it's, it looks nicely composed. But the fact that it's not just an image, that it's uh, responsive text that can reconfigure itself depending on the size of the screen uh, and the relationship to the illustration, I think is this is the kinds of things that I was excited about when responsive design started coming out. This is a very simple example of that, but this is the kind of thing that starts changing your mind from type being a fixed static thing that's stamped down to something that can uh, adjust its surroundings as needed. This is another really great example that I like. This is from New York Times Magazine. Maybe let's try reloading it here so we get the full animation. This is a, a feature they did on skyscrapers in New York City. And again, the, the straight text matter is pretty straightforward, but they have these interesting animations that are working uh, only because they decided to break out of their typical handling of headlines. And again, it's like th those things only show up a couple times, but when they do, it's a really interesting kind of design moment. Um, and it, it speaks to this idea of having the editorial content uh, 
be customized specifically for the, or sorry, have the design be customized for the editorial content. Um, let's go back to full screen view, cross your fingers. All right, that worked. So the interesting thing about those examples and most examples I've seen that are uh, interesting art directed feature design pieces that exist at least partially outside of a templated system is that still a lot of times the fonts that they're using are fonts that are they're just coming off the shelf. Uh, this is partially just due to the way that web fonts work. If you want to get a web font, uh, a lot of times you're going through some kind of service where they have a catalog and all the fonts have been uh, checked out and they're, um, they've been verified by that service. Uh, this is good for people who don't want to have to worry about if the font's going to crash their page or something like that. Um, but for people who are doing more experimental things, it is a little more limiting. Also, just from a design standpoint, it means that the fonts that you have access to are only fonts that people have considered uh, worthy of completing. It's very hard to find a font service, especially a web font service, where you can use a font that isn't completely finished yet or that is uh, yeah, in, in development. There, of course, you can always work with a, a type foundry uh, who is making the font for you and have a back and forth relationship. And I actually really enjoy when those kinds of things happen. Uh, New York Times Magazine uh, did stuff like that. But usually to do that, you have to ha first know that you can do that and also have a budget to be able to do that. Um, however, more recently, I'm happy to say there are more options outside of the realm of fonts uh, that have been kind of blessed to be taken all the way through to completion. This one, uh, I'm a little, I was a little reluctant to mention it because it not much happened with it after it was launched. This uh, was from 2015 when Adobe released its Adobe Type Concepts program, which I really like in theory. And it was one of the first kinds of concepts like this to come out, uh, especially from a large company. Uh, the whole idea is basically that they would release typefaces in an early stage with a limited character set so that people could kind of see whether or not they even are worth completing. Unfortunately, as far as I know, only two fonts uh, were released under this program. I don't know if they have plans to continue with them or not, um, but they definitely have some design talent that I would be interested to see more uh, kind of one-off ideas that aren't, you know, even before they're, they've been blessed to have a full uh, production run. 2016, about a year later, uh, there was this project by the Pipe Foundry. I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, the idea of the Pipe Foundry was that every week in 2016, uh, they would release a new typeface. And these were all, or most of them, maybe all of them, were just one-off fonts. Um, they had usually limited character sets. Many of them were all caps. But you can see that they're definitely taking some clues from the 19th century, both in the idea of making typefaces that almost look like they're coming from the 19th century. They're definitely inspired by the 19th century. But also, uh, they're bonkers in the way that a lot of the typefaces from the 19th century are and they're being rela released, um, in, I don't want to say it's an informal uh, release process, but the fact that it's happening every week means that uh, there isn't as much weight over every single release. If they release something and the font had a bug in it, uh, I don't think anyone would expect that a font that's being released every week especially because these were uh, available for free download at the time, uh, it's hard to complain about something like that. And I've seen these in use, and it's, it's really refreshing because I think a lot of these might not, uh, if they were 
being released through a major type foundry, they wouldn't have made it through. Some people may have said, oh, these are too weird to spend a lot of money finishing. Uh, 2017, the next year, is the Font of the Month Club starting. This is from David Jonathan Ross. He's a good friend of mine and a, a collaborator. But uh, the Font of the Month Club is cool because he releases a font every month. And uh, similar to the Pipe Foundry, there is a bit less of a weight on him to do something that is really, you know, ground shatteringly good or something that you're going to use for the rest of your life. These are essentially display faces. There are a couple text faces in here, but uh, it's basically his playground to do things that he wants to do without uh, feeling this uh, big weight over each release. And actually, I think a lot of the, a lot of the things that he's released through this, which he may not have released otherwise, have become some of my favorite typefaces. Uh, most recently, this year, this year? Yes, future fonts. So the font that you saw on my title slide is a future font. And the concept of future fonts, um, actually this is maybe if you're coming to see Lizzie give a talk, later on this is a kind of a good intro or if you haven't heard of it before maybe this will inspire you uh, lizzie will be coming to talk about future fonts and the general idea is it's a platform for type designers to release unfinished typefaces and you can license those unfinished typefaces for not that much money um, and as the typefaces are developed as more features are added as more glyphs are added uh, you get the benefit if you're an early adopter of uh, getting all those updates for free. Uh, it's also really cool because there are just a lot of kind of weird things on there. Let's have a quick look through. Um, I would encourage you also just to look at this site on your own, but you can see pretty quickly that this is stuff that is not what I would consider a standard typeface. There are definitely some useful text faces in here, but a lot of them are display faces that can be hard sometimes to justify, you know, going through the process of making uh, a full glyph set. So it's a way for type users to get early access to fonts, especially interesting fonts, and uh, for type designers it's great because it, gets, it allows them to uh, weigh a little bit on how much people actually like a font before they uh, spend a ton of time and energy finishing them. So there are now options, I would say. If you're a graphic designer and you want to start using weirder or more interesting or more brand new typefaces, uh, there are now more and more options for that. The other thing that I think most graphic designers and certainly most web designers never even consider is that you can just call a type designer or um, sometimes they tend to be introverts so email might be better but uh, you can contact a type designer and just say that you're interested in having uh, if you have an interesting idea for a typeface and an interesting application for it I think a lot of type designers are willing to uh, have a conversation at least about options for developing a new typeface uh, even if it's just a limited character set or has limited features. The thing that really gets the most interesting now is when all of this stuff starts coming out. Oh, this is great. This font doesn't have any kerning and I can see that now on my slide. Um, one of the downsides of using unfinished fonts. Uh, not only are there these new interesting typefaces that you can use, but there are also new technologies in which to use them or in which they can be created. Um, one very good example of this is this concept of a CSS grid. I'm not, this talk isn't about CSS. It isn't even really that much about web design. Um, but I just wanted to show this example because, I don't know, it has a lot of type and it looks cool. Um, 
But CSS Grid is a relatively new web standard that allows you to do gridded layouts in a way that was very hard, um, in a responsive way, in a dynamic way, and in a way that you can control much better than you previously would if you were using something like tables, which a lot of people did in the 90s, or if you were kind of doing weird hacks to get things to do what you want them to do. Um, so this is just one example of many uh, new CSS functionalities that are coming out or have come out recently that make the, the practice of designing a responsive web page even more exciting. Um, the second one, the second example, and maybe kind of most close to me, is this concept of variable fonts. How many people here have heard of variable fonts? Okay, almost everyone. That's more than I thought. Um, so variable fonts for the several people in here who haven't heard of them, it's what it sounds like and it's what you saw on the screen. Uh, there's a new uh, open type specification, new version of the open type specification that allows you to make fonts that instead of being static fixed shapes, have the ability to move along an axis of design or multiple axes of design. This is a color font, which is a whole other thing. Uh, look it up if you're interested. Um, some of these things are pretty standard act design axes that you would see in normal typefaces, but they're more fluid. Um, some of them are a little more extreme than others and allow for a wider range of stylization. And this isn't a brand new idea. There have been ideas similar to this that, uh, you know, starting as late or as early as the late 70s through the 90s, there was the true type GX and multiple master formats, which never really caught on. But this format, I think, compared to those, is much more interesting and much more likely to uh, influence the way typography works for several reasons. The first is the people that are involved. I think Apple, Google, Microsoft, Adobe, a lot of people that make type, a lot of people that might make type tools are all involved, um, which is, you couldn't say that about other previous formats that allowed similar functionality um, that became ultimately obsolete. The other thing that is that makes this more interesting or more uh, of a convincing thing that you might want to do is the, just the idea of responsive design didn't really exist. And, uh, and for some of the older formats, the web didn't even exist when they came out. And when you're thinking about responsive design and you're thinking about adjusting things fluidly uh, based on context and in a dynamic way based on rules that you set up ahead of time, uh, it allows for the system of a page layout to not stop at the level of the typeface. Previously with a responsive design, the page was very flexible, but the typeface itself was just kind of a frozen static thing. Now that flexibility goes all the way down through features of the typeface in ways that they couldn't before. This is a, a great example of interesting things that you can do when you have a variable typeface that are completely outside the realm of what most typical design axes uh, allow. So this site that I'm showing here is uh, bfonts.com. This is a site that I maintain. It's basically a collection of variable fonts as they come out as I see them. Uh, it's kind of a side project of mine, but if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I would encourage you to go there. Uh, there's the added bonus that a lot of the fonts that are on here are available um, for cheap. Some of them are available for free just for personal testing. Some of them are open source. Some of them are paid commercial typefaces. There's a wide variety of different kinds of licensing options and also just different designs. Um, so if you haven't looked into this technology yet, I would encourage you. Um, in the end, this is kind of like, all this stuff is very, very new. Uh, I just did a workshop this weekend 
uh, for type at Cooper West about making variable fonts with the students there. Uh, and I think a couple days before the workshop started, there was some new technology change that I had to adjust for. It's definitely like the, it feels like the Wild West. And because of that, it kind of leads me now to my uh, conclusion of the thesis of my talk, if, if there is any, is the idea that um, historically when there were situations that you had the opportunity to print something and use a weird typeface or a, a new typeface, it was very easy for people to do that because that was just how things worked. Nowadays, if you want to make an announcement or publish an article, uh, it seems like a lot more work to do it on your own instead of publishing it through uh, an existing template-based system. Uh, so my call to action for everyone here is that the next time you are going to make a baby announcement or make a flyer for a party or even just announce a party on a social media, uh, to think about how you might be able to do it uh, and use it as an excuse to both use new and interesting typefaces and use new and interesting technologies to do it. Uh, it doesn't even necessarily need to be a web-based technology. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a brand new typeface. There are plenty of old typefaces that are also weird. But I, I just want to encourage you, I guess, to, uh, if you ever have something small to do, use it as an excuse to uh, go outside of the comfort zone of the easiest uh, path to doing that thing. Because I think what you'll find in the process, uh, not only will it inform you and your design process, but it will probably also just be more cool and more interesting. So that's the end of my talk, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Nick. Um, we are a bit tired with time, so I'll let three questions pass by. Is anybody has a question? Raise your hand. You talked a lot about how these tools and technologies have uh, changed over time. Mm -hmm. um, if you could predict predict what would happen next after variable fonts, or like what's the next add-on to that, what would you predict? Uh, that's always a tricky thing to do, but it's something I like to do, and especially as someone who looks back on the history of type and seeing all the changes that happened, seeing all the new typecasting machines that were invented or uh, photo typesetting, see how, how that changed everything. I like to think, okay, like 100 or 200 years from now, when they look back on this, what are they gonna say? Like, what was the thing that changed it? And I think one possible thing, I'm not gonna put any money on this, uh, but one possible thing that could significantly change the concept of typography is the reliance on rectangles. And uh, to kind of explain what I mean is that the Gutenberg system of making type was all about having a glyph that existed inside of a rectangle. And that box determined how much space that glyph had and determined how it related to other glyphs. Um, and that concept, when we moved to digital type, also carried over. If you're a type designer, which I know you are because you're a student in the program, uh, you're still drawing glyphs in a rectangle, and that rectangle is still informing how things lay out on a page. For script systems uh, other than Latin, there are some times where that rectangle can be very problematic. For Arabic is a great example uh, where trying to shoehorn these concepts of calligraphy and hand rendered text into a rectangle, sometimes it gets more complicated than it seems like it should. Uh, so that's one thing that I can imagine if there's some new type format that isn't based on rectangles but based on other shapes. Maybe you can define the shape that your glyph lives with, and somehow that informs other things. Um, so that's one guess, I guess. Um, 
when you were going over like uh, GeoCities and how much like expression people had in those mediums and how sort of like tools like Squarespace and Facebook right now, they exist as a way of connecting people and like really like letting people have websites that aren't technically advanced and stuff like that. Um, do you have thoughts or ideas on ways to sort of like re-enable that for a wider audience? Um, it's an interesting question because uh, I taught a responsive web design class a couple years ago and I've been teaching it now uh, almost every year. And when we were first doing it, there were many students in the class who had never written a line of code before. And I was trying to think of the easiest way for them to get space on a web server so they could publish the things that they were making in the class. Uh, and I thought, surely there must be something like GeoCities that exists where you just get some server space and you can put some stuff on. Uh, it was surprisingly hard. I was actually shocked even after like asking on Twitter what people knew about. I thought for sure everyone's going to give me one very obvious answer. And it wasn't for a while that finally someone clued me into this website that was called NeoCities, which is basically like a revival of the concept of GeoCities um, but it seems to be targeted towards children, which I think is cool. Uh, it's because of that, it makes it uh, very friendly for people who aren't familiar with coding and code editing and things like that. Um, but it gives you this, a lot of the same kind of flexibility. Um, related to that, I think the more we get people thinking about code, or even if they're not writing code, but thinking in uh, kind of logical ways when they're younger as children, uh, I think that would definitely help. And I can only imagine now that that's already well underway, now that people are growing up with computers from birth. Um, the problems I see the most are the shortcuts. They're, well, I wouldn't say they're necessarily problems, but there are a lot of shortcuts that exist that make things easier, but they also make it so you're relying more on someone else's decisions. Uh, and the thing that I like about GeoCities and now NeoCities or just writing your own code is that every decision that's put in the page is something that you're thinking about and it's a decision that you're explicitly making. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think uh, getting kids more involved in coding earlier is a way to kind of help push that along. Cool, thanks. Any other question, last question? No, okay, thank you, Nick. Thank you.